A trial date is set for former President Trump, and concerns grow over America's aging leadership. And if you're president again, will you lock people up? The answer is you have no choice because they're doing it to us. Former President Trump promises revenge if he's reelected after a judge schedules his election interference trial to start the day before Super Tuesday. Plus... All right, I'm sorry, you all. We're going to need a minute. The Senate's top Republican freezes again, and a new poll shows President Biden's age has voters worried, raising new concerns about the advanced age of America's most important political leaders. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation. Committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson. Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves. Robert and Susan Rosenbaum. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and Moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. This week, we got further proof that the 2024 presidential race could be the most unusual in U.S. history. On Monday, Judge Tanya Chutkin set Trump's federal election interference trial for March 4th, 2024. The collision between the political calendar and Trump's trials was described in a Wall Street Journal editorial entirely accurately as a, quote, spectacular mess. It's possible that Trump, the runaway leader in the GOP polls, could already be his party's de facto nominee when jury selection begins. But it's unclear if a conviction in any of his criminal cases will influence voters. Trump also pled not guilty in Georgia to charges that he tried to overturn the state's 2020 election results. And for the second time in as many months, the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, froze at an event while answering questions from reporters. That's okay. What are your thoughts on running for re-election in 2026? What are my thoughts about what? Running for re-election in 2026. Oh. <laughs> That's good. This episode sparked bipartisan concern for the 81-year-old senator's well-being. If I spoke to Mitch, he's a friend. I'm confident he's going to be back to his old self. McConnell's health issues have highlighted age as a national political issue. A new poll shows three-quarters of the public think that President Biden, who is 80, is too old to serve another term as president. And 69 percent of Democrats agreed. Joining me to discuss this and more, Kyle Cheney. He's senior legal affairs reporter at Politico. Asma Khalid, NPR White House correspondent and co-host of the NPR Politics podcast. Mark Leibovich, a staff writer and my colleague at The Atlantic. And Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today. Thank you all for being here. Susan, let me just start with you and, and, and ask you this. I mean, are we, are we just kidding ourselves? Uh, do we already know who the Republican nominee for president is? Well, I think that we know the likely nominee. I think it's increasingly clear that his rivals are not going to keep him from getting the nomination. The only person who would cost Donald Trump the nomination at this point, I think, is, is Donald Trump. Maybe through some health problem. I mean, he's, 70, he's 77. 77. I mean, it only, makes him young in this only context. Only young in comparison right. to 80. Um, he's got these unprecedented legal problems, including a trial that we think will start uh, as the primaries are going on. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's possible Trump's not, not the nominee, but I think that is up to... Trump's actions and the consequences of what happens to Trump, not to these rivals that we have seen debate on stage recently. Right. Mark, is this, um, are we in a situation where the Republican race is actually the race, is sort of an audition to, to be Trump's vice president? It, it certainly looks that way. I mean, that's how the debate last week in Milwaukee played out in some ways. I mean, Rick Scott, I mean, there's been some speculation that he was sort of running for that position for a while. He didn't disabuse anyone of it. He didn't do particularly well. Nikki Haley got a lot of immediate sort of speculation around her. Also, DeSantis might have been. So, yeah, I mean, I think clearly th there is a hesitation on, on part of most of the people on stage to take him on in a serious way. What about way. Vivek Ramaswamy? Is he 
count as a possible vice presidential nominee? I mean, if I, I would say he'd be a decent. I mean, in this sort of day and age, he could be. I mean, sure. I mean, right. Trump would see him as a complete sycophant, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, he would see him as a younger version of himself, which would probably appeal to his narcissism. And there you go. Right, Asma. Any yeah. thoughts on on whether Trump is? already the nominee. In I mean, effect. if you look at historical precedent, I don't think that you can see any Republican primary where uh, an incumbent, and I would say Trump has the, the benefits of an incumbency, has been in the lead by as much as Donald Trump is, and anybody else catch up with him. There's just no historical precedent for it. Um, you know, I know that everybody keeps looking at the other candidates in this field thinking somebody might have popped after the debate. I didn't really think anybody popped. I mean, the clearest indication to that was how they responded to the question about Donald Trump. Very few people were willing to take him on. Um, you had a lot of them kind of tussling with each other. Nobody really shined. But you know, I night. disagree with, with you, Mark, in saying that Nikki Haley was trying out to be vice president. I think she has decided presidency or nothing because she's called Donald Trump the most dis disliked politician in America. That does not seem like an application uh, kind of phrase that you would hear. Tim Scott, I think, um, could really give the Democrats some problems. To put a, a black man on the ticket, a Republican ticket, could draw black voters, and it could give permission to swing voters, to suburban voters, that this is a ticket they could vote with some confidence, even if they feel a little uncomfortable with Trump. Kyle, I want to turn to you uh, and ask you, you've been covering in a, in a deep and granular way the many, many different court cases that are coming. Um, can you tell us, give us your sense of this last week? What was the, what, what, are, what are the things that we should remember about this past week? And what are the things that maybe aren't so consequential? Sure, I mean, I think right now we're seeing a lot of minutia play out in these, in these court cases, just about timing of trials and sort of how the, just who's gonna be tried with who in the 19 defendant, you know, racketeering case in Georgia. These are things that we're all gonna forget in a matter of you know days or weeks when the next shoe drops. I think, I think the biggest thing we're seeing now is what's developing in Georgia with people like Mark Meadows who are trying to bring that case into federal court. Um, I think that's going to define you know, the, the way that trial moves forward and whether Trump uh, is, you know, face, again, faces uh, a federal judge in that case or goes, goes into Fulton County and that, that affects the way the jury is selected, that affects the way the defendants uh, are tried together or not. Um, so I think that's more significant. Um, and what we saw was kind of a mini trial of Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff. I mean, he, you know, essentially had to take the stand, which is remarkable at this stage in a criminal proceeding when I mean, it's just starting. Um, and we may see that actually play out with other co-defendants like Jeffrey Clark and others who are supposed to be on trial with Donald Trump. Right. Right. Could you uh, go to this question of the, the federal trial, the sure. Tanya Chutkin sure. trial? What are the chances that this trial actually starts in the beginning of March? You know, I, th I think the conventional wisdom is trials always move. I actually think that that date is likelier than people expect to hold. And I think that's because, you know, in the normal give and take of the legal process, trials get moved all the time. There's, there's delays, there's issues with evidence. But I think here, you know, there's this conflicting schedules, you know, but here, this should be everyone's top priority. Every single person involved, there's no reason to say, oh, well, I have other trials coming up, so I had to, can we, can we please move the date? You have a former president standing, taking a criminal trial for the first time in history. Uh, there's no reason why anything else should take precedence over that. So I think she is seemed intent on sticking to that schedule, and I don't see why any of the parties would get any leeway to say, oh, you know, things came up, so I couldn't meet the deadlines. Right, and just walk us through this. How long would a trial, a typical trial like this go? When would we know the, the results of this trial? When will so, we hear a verdict? So the government, uh, the, the prosecutors have estimated that their case, just the prosecution case, would take four to six weeks. And so you factor in at generously, or like, you know, one week of jury selection could take two or even three weeks to, do, to select a jury beginning on March 4th. You may not, if you don't start a trial till late March, you could be talking early to mid-June, and the issue there is you have another criminal trial scheduled in Florida on May 20th. So uh, if, they, if, if this trial doesn't move along uh, at the pace the government expects, and who knows how long Donald Trump's defense might take, will he put on a defense case? Usually defenses end up shrinking over time. They say, oh, we'll, we'll need a month, and it ends up taking three days. Mm -hmm. But um, he may want to call 100 people to the stand. So you know, you've got this collision course happening with multiple cases, um, but I don't think you'd see a verdict in that March 4th case until at least late May, early June. And then you've got the political challenge, too, that you're running into a summer where there's an RNC convention right. scheduled in Wisconsin and, and Donald Trump's the likely nominee. Right, right. And, and just 
keep on this granular issue because of, of, of the mechanics of next year. If he's on trial in Washington, he has to be there because it's a criminal trial. That's right. He can't choose to not attend. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, even if in theory he would want to, the, the judge would never allow that, and that's partly because you have a jury. You have a jury that develops certain impressions of people, and they, 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 the defendants have a right to be not prejudiced by their absence in a criminal case. In a civil case, and Donald Trump has several of, several of those going to trial in the next few months, potentially, uh, he doesn't have to be there, and, and he probably won't be there. Um, but in his criminal cases, he'll have to sit in the room uh, and, and be present potentially for, for several months. Susan, I just, just, I'm asking you to imagine the future, and it hasn't happened yet, so it's, it's a problematic assignment. But May, June, imagine that there's a conviction. Imagine that he's the putative nominee. Uh, is there anything that could happen to keep him from getting the nomination at that point? Well, I'm sure there are things that could happen. But... I think he intends to be the nominee. I think I think his legal strategy and his political strategy are one and the same. His legal strategy is to get reelected as president to give him protection during at least during his term of office uh, to give have the possibility of it, give, pardoning himself uh, in the federal trials. Um, it, but what, before we before we imagine the future, can you imagine the present where we are sitting around talking about? The, president, the former president's trial, and will it prevent him from getting the nomination again? And by the way, well, what will voters think about electing someone who's a convicted felon? Would that bother any Americans? Right. And the, no, 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 we're obviously in a simulation on Earth, oh, too, no, right uh, now. Yeah, yeah it's, that's it's clear just, to me. I think we shouldn't lose sight of these ex extraordinary times that are just beyond anything that the founders ever could have imagined. Right. Well, I mean, you, we, we've spoken about this, actually. You, you know, the, there are no... There is no, there's no protections for some of this built into the Constitution because the writers of the Constitution never imagined this. Is that, is that no, a fair? It, it, I, I, can't, I can't imagine they did. I mean, as we, as we talked about, you know, there's the, the, the mechanism of impeachment is the way you deal with a, pres a president who presumably has uh, violated his oath or the law while in office and, um, or done something unforgivable. And, and you know, impeachment seen, as a tool seems kind of like a, a broken process in, in the modern era. Um, so even if he were convicted, I, uh, you know, and, and somehow elected president, I don't think that tool would be avail, you know, would avail, Congress would avail itself of that option either. Right. The main tool America has is the vote every four years. That's how we choose who becomes president, and that's where we're, that's where we're heading. Um, Osama, I, I'm very curious. You cover the White House. Um, how is the Biden administration, how is the campaign thinking about how to run against someone who may very well be a convicted felon. Well, uh, I will say broadly, I mean, the White House will publicly never touch Trump. So let's put that, they sort of try to create this division where There's gonna whenever be a time asked, when they, have they to, don't no? want to talk. Yeah, no, yeah. if he's the nominee, I think that becomes very challenging. But in terms of the campaign and the advisors, I mean, one thing I have begun to notice is throughout this summer, you saw Biden, you often saw VP Harris out on the road extensively talking about running to preserve freedom. And freedom means a whole bunch of things. It means Donald Trump, I would say, in some degree. It means abortion rights. It means voting rights. They equate it with guns. Um, and that messaging is something that this administration, that this campaign, is going to continue with. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think it's an interesting message because uh, other things, you can talk about the economy, you can talk about um, issues of age, which we'll get to, mm -hmm. could be bigger challenges for this White House. But on democracy and freedom, they look at the fact that they had success with that message in the midterms, and they think it will continue to be a potent issue for them, especially if they can point to Donald Trump being the Republican nominee on the other side. There's no one like Trump who really galvanizes Democrats when it comes to enthusiasm. Right. Mark, I mean, is there is there a strategy you can imagine? No, no president has had to devise a strategy of, to run against a convicted felon before. Can you imagine what they're going to do? I mean, you would think it would be an asset, right? I mean, it certainly, you would think if that we it would be in a, a fine simulation, position yes. to be in if we were not in a weird simulation. I mean, look, I mean, we, there's an apples to orange compo oranges component to this, which is that we're dealing with a primary landscape right now versus a general election landscape. Right. I mean, I do want to point out, and this didn't get a lot of attention, but at the debate the other night, uh, Christie and to some degree Asa Hutchison were kind of going after Trump and there was this big wall of noise from the crowd like these boos and immediately they were coming to Trump's defense um, 
because I was covering the debate, which means I was in a media center with access to TV sets that had feeds that showed the crowd, uh, there was actually a fair amount of support in the audience and a lot of nodding heads for this not being a good thing. So these are hardcore Republicans, and I do think that, that it is kind of important to try to place ourselves in the spring 2024 mindset of what this actually could look like in real time. Do you think that there are Republicans out there who will, supporters of Donald Trump, who will, if he's convicted, just change their minds? Not supporters of Donald Trump, but I think that there, we're talking, you know, conservatively maybe 50 percent of Republicans who is, you know, Trump is not their first choice, and it could have a chilling effect, certainly as you get closer to an election. Right. Let's um, let's talk about age, because we, we, we've, uh, we've, we've mentioned Mitch McConnell. This is the second time this happened. There is a, there's a, an odd thing that happens when Mitch McConnell has a health scare uh, in that Washington begins to talk about Joe Biden's age. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily fair to Joe Biden, but but here we are. Mitch McConnell, who is having all these serious health problems. Uh, serious health problems, and obviously everybody wishes him well. And Joe Biden, in a kind of almost archaic move, given how Washington is, <laughs> wished him well. It doesn't happen. Doesn't happen in a cross-partisan way anymore. But 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 talk about talk about this. Is he? Is there a chance that that he steps down? And what would that mean? Sure. What would that mean for the Republican leadership in the Senate and possibly negotiations over over uh, over budget issues and and government shutdown issues? I mean, is it possible he doesn't step down at some point? It it seems unlikely to me that uh, that he serves the rest of his term as the leader of of the Republican Party in the in the Senate. Um, it's it's. It's bad, and, and there are there are several people, all of them named John, who would like to secede him as as a Republican leader, and all of them are respected. Can you name so. the Johns? John Thune, <laughs> John Barrasso, and John Cornyn. So you win a prize. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, can I get, take the mug home? You get to take the mug, <laughs> possibly. But you know, it's it's bad news for Biden in two ways. One is it spotlights age as a risk factor, which Biden doesn't need. The other thing is Biden needs McConnell as a for governing in the next couple months to fund the government. You know, the government's about to run out of money at the end of this month and could shut down. Uh, the aid to Ukraine is something that Mitch McConnell has been very helpful with for the administration. So, oh, this is bad news for McConnell. This is bad news for Biden, too. Interesting. Um, Asma, as uh, someone who covers the White House and also covers the Democratic electorate, mm -hmm. um, is this the explanation for Biden's difficulty in the polls, his age? It could be one of the explanations. Um, you know, you had the poll numbers out there earlier, yeah. and the crosstabs will show you that a majority of Democrats are concerned about Biden's age. Um, there's no doubt. I heard this. I was out talking to a bunch of young voters at the NAACP convention this summer. Um, it is one of the reasons. But I also think that there are other reasons why Biden has struggled in the polls. Um, you see a lot lackluster support when you talk about uh, progressives, young voters, folks on the left who don't feel like he's delivered on certain agendas. Into items. Again, I'm not saying that these voters will turn towards Donald Trump when there's actually an ultimatum of whom, of whom to vote for. But look, I think the age question is one that you hear from a lot of Democratic activists who are concerned. It is kind of an unspoken thing amongst Democrats who will whisper it and say it very quietly that they are concerned a health scare could pop up anytime between now and next November. Um, you know, I think that this White House, uh, you could say, is, is aware of that. And I think it you don't want to say that there's necessarily a cause and effect. But if I look back in June, you all remember there was this moment where President Biden tripped over a sandbag when he was delivering remarks in Colorado. Ever since then, um, I've been out with him. He tends to use the lower staircase in going up Air Force One. That was not a routine thing that he did prior to that, at least that I recollect. And, you know, look, is it a cause and effect? Who knows? But nobody uh, within the Democratic circle really wants to take the risk of a president tripping as he's going up on the plane. Right. Mark, um, you've written a lot about this issue of age, and you spent some time recently with Governor Whitmer of Michigan, e everybody's idea of a future Democratic presidential nominee. Uh, how bad is this for, for, for Biden? Is there, any, uh, is there any possibility that anyone in the Democratic Party is going to challenge what is now the status quo, that Joe Biden is the nominee and Kamala Harris is his running mate? Um, you know, this could be wish casting. I, I think it gets less possible every day. But it also, look, the opportunity is there for a Democrat to, I think, give Democratic voters a choice. Now, 
I will say that Donald Trump has not only made Republicans terrified of him, but he's also made Democrats very risk averse. And when you're risk averse, you don't want to sort of go for a fresh face. You don't want to, you know, try your hand at something that hasn't worked before. I mean, there's nothing more conservative than going with the guy who won the last time. So, and or with someone who's as familiar with him. Look, I, I think I, I could make a case, and I'm not going to bore anyone with this, but I think that people, I, I think that a Democrat who was ambitious and savvy and respectful could make an extremely compelling case for him or herself. What are the chances of that happening? I don't, I don't think it happens unless Biden opens the door to it. I don't think it's going to happen without Biden saying, I'm stepping down or for, for, what, for whatever reason. But if Biden did that, I think there would be a big contest. Um, sure. Including Vice President Harris, That's including I think it would split you know the party gov in many ways. a Midwestern Democratic governor. That is a, those, that could be a formidable uh, candidate. Uh, Amy Klobuchar um, ran a respectable race last time. I mean, I think there would be a lot of competition for that, and it would be pretty messy because are you trying to deny the first mm -hmm. black woman to be elected to national office to deny her? a chance to move up a slot. And yes, there are Democrats who'd be happy to challenge Kamala her. Harris has problems with popularity, but the base is with Kamala, yeah? Is that, is yeah, that a fair I, statement? I, mean, I went out with her quite a, you know, to a number of stops this summer, and really the campaign sees her as being sp specifically able to court black and brown voters, young voters, and these are base voters that the Democratic Party needs. Um, she has been out there a lot more on the campaign, but to your point, um, I think it would be very messy if Biden, for any reason, were not to run, or even, frankly, and, and say he wins a second term and doesn't run, and if Kamala Harris is not, if a lot of other Democrats contest her, I think it could be messy for the party. And uh, I don't know that, that that there's a clear answer of what would happen. Yeah, I, I think what's happening now is pretty messy, too. It might just be quieter and less polite to talk about mm -hmm. in public. You mean, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I think these massive poll numbers, uh, you know, against Biden, largely because of his age and the age itself. I mean, look, he's 80 years old. I mean, we cannot sit here and make him any younger, unfortunately. So that is a, um, you know, to me, that is central here. And again, it's, it's a little too clear cut to talk about, but it's very, very messy. Right. Could you just talk for one more minute, just from your reporter perspective? Mm -hmm. you, you're watching him incredibly closely. You, you've studied the stairs of Air Force One and which staircase people use. Do you feel like he's noticeably slowed down in any form or fashion? Um, look, I, I, I went out with Biden a good amount during the 2020 campaign. Um, I think there are, there is an attempt by the staff to manage him more closely and carefully than there was during 2020. Physically. Physically, but also even, I would say, um, I mean, this is no secret, right? I think that there was an effort to kind of, he doesn't do press conferences as often, right? He'll take questions here and there under the wing, but he was just more off the cuff as a candidate, mm -hmm. speaking to reporters at different stops where he would go. Um, look, I think ultimately, no matter how fit or unfit somebody is, at the age of 80, potentially being 82 upon inauguration, that raises questions for anybody of any, of any health. I kind of wonder, too, how much of this is driven. You know, Republicans on the, on the other side have spent four years almost kind of weaponizing Biden's age against him. Trump is not that much younger than him, but we don't ever talk about Donald Trump's age. You don't see age. in the poll numbers and, and, either as much. Right. Why, why is that? I mean, I mean that, that's, a great, that's a great question, in part because I don't think you've had this years of concerted effort. I mean, Don, Donald Trump, they're running ads showing Biden tripping every five mm -hmm. seconds, and I think that that, that you know, creates an, a sort of an aura that, that, that sticks, that is sort of stuck with Joe Biden. John Trump has always been very good at, at branding his opponents, um, you know, in ways that they can't shake. And this seems to be one of those examples is just talk about Biden's age and his, his health. And every time he coughs, we're going to put that in an ad. Um, and they don't do, there's no counterpart to that to, uh, aimed at Donald Trump, who is, you know, you know, has a different demeanor than, than Biden, but certainly has things you could point out about his, can, his own age. And Can I just actually just point out, though, that, I mean, it's not just making an issue of Biden's age. It's, it's lying. It's saying he's senile, it's saying he's demented, saying he's out of it. I mean, I think it's important to sort of state for a fact that a lot of these are just smears. Right. Mentally, he's quite acute. Seems right. like it. Yeah. Uh, Susan, how did we get to a point where in a country of 330 million people, we probably have a 77-year-old running against an 81-year-old, 78-year-old? And by the way, the two people who ran against each other last time around? Uh, yeah. And where a majority of Americans say, please do not nominate these right. two people. We would like to vote for right. somebody else. Right. This is an essay yeah. question. You have 40 <laughs> seconds to answer. It's because we have, we have two incumbent presidents. Incumbents have a lot of advantages yeah. when it comes to running again. This is incumbent President Trump against incumbent President 
uh, Biden and the likelihood, and I mean, things change, it's a, more than a year away, uh, but it, this is the most likely scenario, the most likely choice Americans are going to have uh, next year. And there's no off-ramp. You're not seeing any off-ramps to this, to this contest right now. Well, not at the, not at the moment, but it's, should we say that, with, given the age of both these candidates and the fact that this one of the candidates is about to go on trial? So, you know, things happen. Things do happen. Um, we have to leave it there for now. It's a fascinating conversation, and we'll continue. Thanks to everyone on the panel for joining us and for sharing your reporting, and thanks to all of you for joining us as well. And tune in Saturday to PBS News Weekend for a look at the lessons learned from Hurricane Adalia and the future of disaster response. That's Saturday on PBS News Weekend. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular... You get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.